It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Michael Walsh, and we're going to be discussing his new book, Last Stands, Why Men Fight When All is Lost. Michael, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Sean. Michael, this is the first time you and I are meeting today. I know you're going to be brand new to much of my audience, so let's kick this off by having you share a bit of the Michael Walsh origin story. For my listeners meeting you for the very first time in our talk today, what are a few things they should know about you? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a long origin story, I'm <laughs> afraid, but uh, uh, basically, uh, I'm a, an author, and uh, I was the classical music critic of Time Magazine for 16 years. And before that, I was a reporter on various newspapers, among them the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle and the San Francisco Examiner. I guess the most fun thing about me is that I was, uh, let's see, present for the second Mount Helens eruption. I was in San Francisco when Moscone and Milk were assassinated. Uh, I was in Russia when Chernobyl blew up, and I was at the Berlin Wall when it came down. So I've had a very dull and uninteresting life, as you can see. You've certainly got to be present for some of our recent milestones in in terms of modern history. Thanks for a little bit of that backstory. You opened the book referencing your father. I think I'd like to start there in terms of some of the themes that come out in this book. What were some of the ways that your father poured into you or or taught you what it it means to be a man? Mm, That's a tough question. I really don't have a specific answer for that. I left home when I was 17. So uh, essentially what he taught me growing up uh, as a boy was what parents in the 50s taught their kids and pretty much in general, although we had a obviously a Marine Corps background, we lived not on bases, but among civilians in the various duty stations. So for example, San Diego, California, Honolulu, Hawaii, Washington, DC, etc. Mostly he's led by example, I think. He's still alive. He's 95 years old come June 1st. So it wasn't until the last few years where we finally sat down and talked about his experiences in Korea as I had gotten this book project up and running. And that gave me a chance to spend more time with him, really, than I ever did uh, from my late teenage years on. It was very illuminating. Kind of probably in the sense, like a lot of us look back where those things we learned from our parents were maybe more caught than taught. Well, as I just said, I wasn't there very much, so (laughs) I I, I can't really add anything to this comment. Next, let's get into the story behind the book. You know, as somebody who works in the the publishing industry, I'm endlessly curious about kind of the why uh, of how a project got its start. So in terms of this project, were you responding to a need you saw in culture something in your own life like what got this project off the ground no i think that's a it's an interesting question uh i think the answer to that is not what you might expect it just happens to be what i felt like doing there's rarely an inciting incident with any project from an artistic point of view uh this is my 16th book so they're on radically different subjects and i think it was just at this point having finished a book uh, that your audience, I think, will appreciate too, in particular, The the Devil's Pleasure Palace and The Fiery Angel, which are quasi-religious, quasi-cultural ways of analyzing Western political history through the mechanisms of art and faith. When I got those finished, something just popped into my head and it said, how about a book on Last Stands as a, as a measure of heroism? I suppose some of the current things floating around in the atmosphere influenced me. But I I think with any writer, artist, or creative person, it just pops into your head. And then a lot of ideas do pop into your head. But the one you feel like spending, in this case, the next two and a half years with is the one that you do. It's, It's true in the movie business, too, where our lag time from the time a writer sits down to write a script to the fastest possible time that movie can come out is at least two years, and most of those projects take 10 or more years. I wrote a novel called In All the Saints, which is a a fictionalized autobiography of a famous New York City gangster in the 1920s, and that took me seven years to write, 
but it only took me seven weeks to type. Once I have the idea in mind, I, I just research the heck out of it. And then one day I sit down and a month or two later, it's all done. So that's, that's really, it's very unromantic kind of story, but it's, it's the truth about this one too. I, I just got obsessed with the idea of last stands and what they tell us about our Western cultural history and started with the Greeks. Uh, I made up a list and I kept to it pretty much. Some battles didn't make it and other battles squeezed their way in when I was least expecting it. Uh, mostly you, you write in a kind of intuitive and but subconscious fashion. I, I like to tell people, I, I like to write my books all in one sitting, which is really what I do. It's just sometimes that sitting may take a month and sometimes it may take six months. It's, it's hard to predict once you, until you get into it. I just finished the book today, and I can say you cover an awful lot of ground. So it was interesting trying to come up with a way to have a conversation about the book. I, I think sure. for this for this next part of the interview, I'd love to just maybe have you give us some highlights from some of the different cultures, some of the different people groups that you cover in the book, and, and what they can show us about kind of this tendency towards how we would approach Last Stands. Talk to us about the Spartans. What are some of the key things we can learn from their story? Well, everybody knows that particular story, the Spartans. It's the, to talk about origin stories, it, it is the origin story of, of Western heroism. If anyone who saw the movie 300 saw a fictionalized version of it, it's been treated in the movies before and certainly in literature as well. It's, this story is that the 300 Spartans who weren't celebrating a, a religious holiday, that's the key to this whole thing, decided they'd go forth and try to halt the Persian invasion of the main part of the Greek territory, and they held out against a, a very large force of Persians. We don't know precisely how many men it was. Ancient historians tend to wildly overguess the number of people involved in these battles, but they had a, a couple thousand other Greeks. Remember, there was no such thing as Greece. They were all little independent city-states, often at war with each other. They stopped the Persian incursion for three days until they were overwhelmed and wiped out. And the Persians then marched down into Athens, uh, set it on fire, occupied it. But it gave the other Greek city-states enough time to rally. And then the Athenians defeated the Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis. And then at the Battle of Plataea, the Spartans got their revenge on what was left of the Persian ground forces. And wiped them out. So that was the end of the Persian invasion of what turned out to become the European Western culture homeland. That's why we, we honor it. And the fact that these men were brave enough to sacrifice themselves makes it very special. Now, the Spartans were a different kind of group of people. We wouldn't admire their society very much right now. It was highly militaristic and merciless, but it was what was needed at that time. So without the Spartans, we wouldn't have had the golden age of Athens. And then from Greece, we go to Rome. And from Rome, we go across Western Europe and into modern society. So it's really the, the origin story of everything. Next, let's jump over to Rome. Uh, obviously, they have had a, a broad impact in terms of their ideas and their ideals living on. What were some of the ways that they made an impact? I mean, what was the effect of the Roman Empire on Western civilization? Exactly. Yeah, you know, just if if you can summarize that in just a few moments, yeah, yeah, just some highlights. Well, Western civilization is founded on Rome, so everything we have comes from the Roman Empire. How it developed over the course of, in effect, two thousand years, starting in seven hundred BC, which is the mythical founding of Rome by Romulus and Remus continuing through the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the late 5th century, and then finally the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, which didn't happen until 1453, when the Turks concert, uh, conquered Constantinople. The Romans gave us our essentially our legal system, our languages, uh, our English language is part Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, and part Francified Norman which was uh, a Latin-based language. So all the long words in English come from Latin and all the short ones come from Anglo-Saxon. They established the boundaries of what are effectively the countries of Europe today. So, for example, France was 
called Gaul, G-A-U-L, in uh, in Roman times, and Caesar conquered it, made it a province of of Rome uh, at the be- at the end of the Republic, the beginning of the Empire. Now, without Rome, we really don't have much of anything. We'd we'd probably just be a collection of barbarians living in trees. Uh, the Roman Empire is really quite fascinating, and everyone who is an inheritor of its tradition really ought to know more about it. I would recommend the decline and fall of the Roman Empire by given that it's, as you may know, it's several million words long, but it's a, a wonderful, a magnificent piece of, uh, of scholarship that uh, is, is, remains the, the basic text of how we got here today. Well, let's fast forward a bit in history. Next, talk to us about the Alamo, something that, especially if you know, you're from Texas here in the States that lives large uh, mm. in, in that area's story. What did the Alamo give us in terms of a, a love for freedom and self-determination? It's, it's a core part of the American story. Yeah, it is. I have a actually a kind of a problem with the Alamo. I, I, I've been asked about it all, all, all the time while we've been talking about this book, and, and it puzzles me because I don't find it particularly interesting. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not a Texas fan, for one thing. Um, and also, as I say in the first sentence of the book, it's uh, a politically incorrect uh, last stand. I'm not disparaging the bravery of the Texans, but the way the Alamo came about, very, which most Americans don't know, of course, is that the Mexicans, having won their independence from Spain, had a problem. They had a huge territory in North America that they were unable to colonize and unable to defend. So they were being raided by the Comanche Indians, who were the the great warrior tribe of the Southwest. And they asked the Anglos to come in and start to settle that part of what's now Texas and all the way to New Mexico, Arizona, California, because they just didn't have enough people. The, the difference between the British colonization of North America and the Spanish and, to some extent, Portuguese occupation of what's now Latin America, Central and South America, is, is completely different. The reason the United States evolved as a major power was that the Brits, uh, starting with the English and continuing through waves of European immigration, people came here to actually live and forever uh, and start new lives. The Spanish were very poor colonizers, and they basically exploited their colonies and stripped them of their wealth and sent it back to Spain. Uh, what they didn't do is send hordes and hordes of people who wanted to settle. So as I say in the book, the British were settlers and the Spanish were exploiters. One of the reasons Latin America is so dysfunctional is it still functions along the lines of a Spanish caudillo system, which is highly hierarchical and indeed racial in South America. The lighter and more Spanish you are, the higher up the social ch- chain you are. So that that was one of the conflicts between the Tex- Texians, as they call themselves, and the, the Mexicans. So eventually the Mexicans asked the Texians to leave, and the Texians decided they weren't going to leave, they were going to stay. So they made their last stand at the Alamo, and they fought to the last man very bravely. Most of those Texians were from southern slave states. One of the other issues that we had with Texas, again, adding to the politically incorrectness of the Alamo stand is most of those guys came from slave-owning societies. Some of them, in fact, had even become Mexican citizens where slavery had been outlawed. So they were fighting against their own government uh, in in another respect as well. The Alamo is a very complex thing, and I, I suspect it will fade from American history as we go forward with the de anglicization of North America as it becomes more like South America. Yeah, I I think you bring up a good point of kind of the the folklore of any event is often a bit different as we get into the more complex specifics of what happened at a historical event. Let's talk now about Custer's Last Stand. General Custer is somebody who is large in history and storybooks uh, uh, as well. What is there to learn there? Well, I think Custer is actually the opposite of the of the Alamo. I, I find Custer one of the most compelling, fascinating figures in American history. This chapter is at 10,000 words is the longest chapter in the book. He was a, almost a, a, an archetype uh, 
He was dashing, brave, handsome, the object of the media's fascination. He was the youngest brevet general in American history during the Civil War. Talk about being everywhere. He was everywhere. You, Custer fought uh, throughout the Civil War, and he was present at Appomattox. If you see or take a look at uh, any of the pictures of Appomattox showing Grant and Lee sitting at that very little table where, where Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia, you'll see officers from both sides in the, both sides in the background. And at the junior of juniorist of junior officers is George Armstrong Custer, and he's standing over in the corner. So he was at the battle of uh, at, the, at, at the surrender at Appomattox, and in fact, he was the first Union officer to accept the Confederate what turned into the Confederate surrender. He hated Ulysses S. Grant, who was another of my most favorite characters from American history. Grant hated him, but he was such an effective cavalry commander. He was reckless, he was brave, and he had something called Custer Luck, which is that bullets basically bounced off of him uh, up until the time when they didn't. Uh, Custer and Grant, as, uh, and Grant, as I say, didn't get along very well. Grant uh, effectively court-martialed him at one point, but Custer was protected by Grant's, uh, one of Grant's favorite uh, lieutenants, which was General Phil Sheridan, who was the commander of the cavalry. So when the Indian Wars commenced and the gold was discovered in South Dakota and the settlers poured into South Dakota, there was nothing the federal government could really do about that at that point. Custer wound up there, and of course he wound up on the short end of the Little Bighorn Battle himself. But that battle it's, itself is interesting. The entire Seventh Cavalry was not wiped out. Just the 200 plus men with Custer were killed in a, one area of the battlefield, which is, stretches for two miles. It could have gone the other way. Custer's tactics were not unusual for him. He used them constantly in the Indian Wars and also in, in the sort of brave, headlong, heedless charges, uh, which he had developed in the Civil War. He just uh, wound up on the wrong side of that river and did not have enough intelligence to, ahead of time to know how big the Indian village was. It was huge, probably the biggest Indian village in the history of North America. And the Braves did something that he didn't expect, which is that they didn't run when they saw the cavalrymen. Most of the time, the Indians would see the cavalry and they would leave as fast as possible. And this time they didn't, and that's why Custer was wiped out. But uh, the main thing about the Little Bighorn Battle that's I think Americans today would find interesting is that Custer had political ambitions, partly because he hated Grant so much. And in 1876, uh, it was thought that Grant would run for a third term as president. Uh, it, he turned out not to, but Custer didn't know that. And Custer had decided that he would have a smashing victory at the Little Bighorn and go back to New York City and run for the Democrat, uh, stand for the Democrat nomination for president for the election of 1876. So it was the world's worst campaign event in one, in one sense. Obviously, throughout your book, you cover lots of scenarios of fighting and war. Like if you contrast battles of old versus what modern warfare looks like, has there been kind of kind of a loss or just a change in terms of the lack of toe-to-toe -to -toe combat often in modern warfare? I feel like there can be a, a disconnect there from what you saw in battles of old. Well, th this book stops in 1950, so that those fights are still the same as the Roman and the and the and the Greek fights. I mean, the last the big big last chapter is on the Battle of Stalingrad in, in, during World War II. Today we say that uh, modern warfare is different from old warfare, but I doubt that's true. We are in a funny position where, as the United States, we can afford to fight wars that have no purpose and no ending. We're still in Afghanistan 20 years after 9-11, which is probably the biggest single disgrace in American military history. And the fact that uh, the current administration does not want to remove those troops will, means that it will be extended uh, indefinitely. However, if we have to go to war against, say, communist China, that will not be a war of choice. It will not be a war that can be fought by drones from Tampa. It will be a serious headlong collision that we will have a very difficult time engaging in simply because our army is so relatively small and the all-volunteer force doesn't allow for a rapid call-up of, 
recruits to be put into the field if that were necessary. So I think, and even if we had a nuclear exchange and we lived in a sort of post-apocalyptic world, you'd still be fighting with your hands and your teeth and knives and and spoons and whatever, uh, clubs, whatever weapon you had to hand. So I, I don't think people change. I think we're basically the same as those Greeks. And we we talked about the Romans a bit, but the Roman army at Cannae, which was completely destroyed, uh, practically the last man, by Hannibal, 50 to 75,000 men got killed in one day with swords at that, battle, at, at that battle. And those were just the Roman losses. So you can imagine how brutal a hand-to-hand war would actually be if we have to fight one in the future, which we're not ready to do. If you had to contrast you know, historic societies versus where we are today in terms of uh, whether we want to say a masculine view of the world, what it means to be brave or manly or chivalrous or whatever labels we want to give it, what would you say is the, the biggest difference from societies of old versus where we are in modern society? Well, we're definitely in a feminized society here in, in the United States and in Western Europe, too. Uh, other countries and other societies are not. The Muslims are certainly not a feminized society. They have the exact same attitude towards women that they've had since the 7th century. And their societies are or- organized along masculine principles. Ours always have been until roughly the beginning of the 20th century, because we have the luxury not to be. We're, we're not on a, a, a constant war footing. We, we find war as a kind of an amusing sidelight, especially after World War II. We didn't fight to victory in Korea. We didn't fight to victory in Vietnam. And well, we haven't won a war since 1945. That will change. I've joked with people that this book is really in praise of toxic masculinity. And in fact, my next book will be about women. It'll be a companion volume to to this one about the essential nature of femininity. But as I point out in the introduction to this book, which is called To Die For, war is the natural state of man, as the philosopher Immanuel Kant famously observed, and that intervals of peace are the exception and war is the rule. And war is a masculine thing. Men are just bigger and stronger and faster and all these other physical attributes that comes with that Y chromosome. And to deny this is absurd, and it will lead us down a path that will not have a good ending. And in terms of the the reader's overall journey with the book, I think, you know, different things will stand out to different readers in terms of which periods of history are uh, more interesting to them than others. But in terms of takeaways, you know, how you hope you impact a reader, like what's that one or two things you hope every single reader gleans in the pages of the book? Again, that's a kind of, I I don't mean to criticize your questions, but it's not a question (laughs) authors think. We don't think about it that way. We don't know why we write a book. It comes into our head. We spend two years doing it. We deeply research it. We finish it. We send it off. And it's like sending your child off to college uh, and and you hope it does well. Uh, It's, it's, I don't think, at least speaking for myself, I don't write books that are argumentative. Uh, I, I want the reader to make up his own mind. As I mentioned, my two earlier works, The Devil's Pleasure Palace and The Fiery Angel, these were, uh, well, the first one was a surprise bestseller because it's all about, believe it or not, it's about Milton's Paradise Lost and Goethe's Faust and how we use those as analytical tools to talk about man's condition vis-a-vis God and political society. And it turned out to be a surprise bestseller because people were hungry for that sort of uh, intellectual argument. This book is is much more vivid. It's, you know, I tried to write the battles as vividly and explicitly as I can, being a novelist as, as well and being a screenwriter. Uh, th- those tools certainly helped me in its description. I just want people to think about what it means to be a man as I Uh, We talked about my father earlier. I did dedicate my gangster novel and all the saints to him. And I said in it to my father, who's taught me how to become a man. And he said to me, uh, one of the, he lives in Florida, so I don't see him very often. But he said at one point, well, you've always known how to be a man. So maybe that answers your initial question, which is, uh, I did learn from example. And I think with him, especially the fact that he's so taciturn. He's part American Indian, so he doesn't talk a hell of a lot. And the Indian side outweighs the Irish side with with him, since mostly Irish people love to have the gift of the gab. 
but he teaches by example, and he never complains, and he but never explains either. He goes about his life, and he's lived 95 years. When he got off that boat at Inchon in 1950, his life expectancy was about 25 seconds. So he's done pretty good in laughing in the face of fate, and I think that's a good example for all of us. And Michael, for the listeners who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your books, where can we discover you on the web? Well, the best place is Facebook. I was an early uh, expellee from Twitter because uh, Twitter decided that I was uh, too provocative and conservative, I guess, to be in uh, Twitter company. So I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, look for the book cover at Last Stands. It's, it's the avatar that I use there. And uh, I'll be happy to welcome you aboard and into our very lively conversation. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Michael and pick up your very own copy of his new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Michael Walsh. Once again, our book today was Last Stands, Why Men Fight When All is Lost. Again, if you'd like to pick up your very own copy of this book, head on over to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever great books are sold, you will find it there. And Michael, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a joy to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it.